Um, welcome to another one of our Chief Economist Talks. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, as you know, today, this week is the week of the WDR, and this uh, year's WDR is on jobs. And jobs challenges are huge. They're center stage across the globe. They're everywhere you look at the presidential debates, developing countries, developed countries. Um, and we know worldwide 200 uh, million people, and a disproportionate share of those are youth, uh, tend to be uh, unemployed and they're actively looking for a job. And just to keep employment rates constant, around 600 million new jobs need to be created over the next 15 years. So um, the challenges are huge. And um, I want to uh, kick off the discussion today with a number of messages from uh, our WDR, which lo we launched yesterday. Um, so one of the important messages there is that uh, jobs drive development. So they're not just a byproduct of uh, economic growth. Uh, jobs, even informal jobs, can be quite transformational. Uh, they're important uh, for living standards. You know, poverty falls as people work their way out of um, hardships, especially in countries where the scope for redistribution is low. Um, jobs are important for productivity. People um, learn uh, as they work together and get better at what they do. Uh, more productive jobs appear, less productive ones disappear. Um, jobs are also important for social cohesion. Uh, societies flourish as uh, jobs bring together people uh, from different um, ethnic and social backgrounds. Um, and one of the important messages, I think, of this work is that it's not only the number of jobs that matter, it's actually uh, the quality. And some jobs are better for uh, development than others. So often uh, individual and the social perspective on jobs can be the same, but um, they also differ. Uh, for uh, jobs that pay well, obviously this is good for the individual that's making the money. However, if it's uh, coming at the cost of others because of restrictive regulations um, or special favors, this is not necessarily so good for development. So uh, good jobs for development are those with the highest value for society taking into account spillovers uh, uh, to others, uh, be they positive or um, negative. Um, so uh, I think um, the uh, final messages of the WDR uh, provide interesting and important policy guidance for countries all around the world. Uh, we know that the private sector is the source of nearly 90% of all jobs around the world. Um, but we also know that the role of government is not only to ensure conditions are placed uh, for creation of jobs in the private sector, but also to understand why there are not more um, good jobs for development in particular countries, and to try to remove or mitigate these constraints that different countries face. So there's a three-layer challenge, if you will. First, of course, you want to make sure that there is macroeconomic stability and an enabling um, business environment, good human capital, rule of law, et cetera, which is the basic fundamentals of uh, job creation in the private sector. You want to make sure labor policies are there and they um, do not uh, introduce distortionary interventions uh, that clog the creation of jobs. But finally, and more importantly, where the bulk of the WDR focused on is you want to know your priorities uh, as a country. Because as we said, some jobs do more for development than others, and it's necessary to understand where good jobs for development lie given the country context. And the WDR goes on to discuss what these challenges are in different countries. So today, we're going to focus on Africa. 
and we are going to look at some of the jobs challenges in Africa. And we are very happy to have Susan Lund here with us again. As many of you who come uh, to our seminars often know, we have Susan multiple times at this, um, at this uh, seminars. And uh, we're very lucky to uh, have her to tell us about uh, the recent uh, report that they've launched on Africa and Africa's job challenges. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Susan is a partner in McKinsey and also the director of the Global Institute. After Susan's talk, we are going to uh, follow with a discussion from Shanta Devarajan, who is the chief economist of Africa region in the bank. Susan, please. Thank you. Thank you, Osley, and thanks for having me today. I always enjoy coming to the World Bank because I know I'll get, I have a quite impressive audience here and I'll get lots of tough questions around, really, as Osley said, one of the most important issues in the world today. Um, at the McKinsey Global Institute, the research I'm going to share with you fits into two different themes that we have done a lot of work on. One is job creation. And our interest there focuses both on advanced economies and the challenges you see in Europe and the United States, um, as well as a global picture on what's happening in emerging economies. Um, this report, it was done in collaboration with colleagues um, at McKinsey in our Africa offices. We have five offices on the continent, soon to be six. Um, and we work with governments as well as private sector companies and issues of talent and labor and stability and inclusive growth are big topics. Um, we launched this research because we did a report two years ago called Lions on the Move, where we talked about the, what was driving Africa's growth acceleration over the last decade, um, and we came out with a fairly positive message that there had been fundamental improvements in the macro economy and political stability in the business environment, and that we're seeing the rise of what we call a consuming class that's driving growth internally. Uh, and the big question that we got every single time we presented the work, including here at the World Bank, was, well, is this growth benefiting anyone but large companies and foreign multinationals? And to what extent is the benefit of this growth trickling down to the broader population? Um, and when you look at statistics of st extreme poverty, uh, for instance, the Millennium Development Goals, you do see that the number of households living on a um, dollar a day and two dollars a day has been declining. Uh, but in our mind, one of the best ways to ensure that growth is inclusive is by the creation of jobs and employment. Um, and that led us to embark upon this research. I'm going to give you the highlights here. Um, and this will be followed by remarks from Shanta Devarajan. Um, and then questions. It's good to see so many people that I know in the room today. So what did we find? A quick nutshell, Africa, of course, has a demographic potential. Unlike every other region in the world, uh, it will have the largest growth in labor force over the next decade. And by 2035, it's going to have a larger working age population than either China or India or any other continent on Earth. However, today, when you look at the labor force, uh, you see that only 28% of Africans of working age have what we call a wage-paying stable job. So this means that they're either earning a wage or they're a small business owner in which the small business actually employs mem people outside of the family unit. Um, the unemployment rate, as mo many of you probably know in Africa, is reported at only 9% overall, which isn't terribly high by global standards. Uh, but this disguises the fact that in many countries you don't have social safety nets, so people have to do something to survive. So the broad majority of people, some 63%, are in what we call vulnerable employment. And that can either be informal self-employment in urban areas or subsistence agriculture. And so the challenge for Africa that we focus on is actually how do you increase the proportion of people who have this stable wage-paying job. At current trends, Africa is increasing the share of these types of jobs. Um, however, at current trends, it's going to take 50 years. It's going to be 2066 before Africa and the continent has the same share of stable jobs that you see in East Asia today. So clearly, that's far too long. And it means that the number of people in informal employment and subsistence is going to continue to grow. 
So we looked at opportunities. What is the opportunity to actually move the needle and accelerate job creation from what you've seen at current trends? And we conclude that there is a big opportunity, um, that by focusing on sectors that are labor intensive and create jobs, Africa could create or put a number on it, you know, over 70 million net new jobs over the next decade through 2020. Um, and these come, though, from some surprising sectors, um, manufacturing, retail, hospitality, which includes tourism, and agriculture. And those are the four sectors we then look at in depth to understand what would it take to actually accelerate job creation. Um, we conducted a small business survey as part of this research. The results surprised us and we found very interesting. Um, in five different countries, businesses, when asked, what's constraining your growth, why aren't you hiring more? The number one answer was concern about macroeconomic conditions and stability. So in spite of the growth acceleration, there are still long memories of high inflation and you've seen food price inflation in some countries. Um, that was followed by, I don't have access to finance. Um, and infrastructure uh, being of inadequate quality. So we present what we think is a reasonable strategy for job creation. It actually fits very nicely with what the excellent World Development Report on jobs just came out with in terms of what will it take for governments and how can they reasonably target faster job creation. Um, we start with the same premise that GDP growth alone does not ensure that you're going to get sufficient numbers of jobs and that a job strategy needs some targeted actions that are different than just the overall economic development plan. So some highlights of the research. This chart may be familiar to many of you. Africa's GDP has been soaring. It has been the second fastest growing region in the world after East Asia. East Asia, of course, includes China, so that's a little bit unfair. Um, and growth has continued to be strong throughout this crisis, relatively strong compared to other parts of the world. Now, looking at the labor market, you see that over the next decade, Africa is going to add 122 million people of working age to the population. Um, this is a number that causes concern among some government leaders when they look at the Arab Spring and the fact that unemployed people, particularly young people, can, you know, demand change. Um, and the challenge, of course, will be to create good jobs and oppor economic opportunities for these people entering the workforce. If you look out a little bit further, you see that sometime around 2030, Africa will have the world's largest working age population. This is both an opportunity in that dependency ratios will fall, that should lift domestic consumption, but it's also a challenge in that these people to be productive and to have this be a demographic dividend will need jobs and, and education. So what's happened in the past? This chart shows growth in total employment in Africa over the last decade. Now, those of you that work in Africa know that the data is, I'll politely say, a challenge. And we have undertaken a heroic effort to take the scraps of national data that exist on employment and extrapolate across the continent. I will absolutely not stand by the precise magnitude of any one of these numbers, so please don't ask me about that. But directionally, the trends seem very clear. You have a growing population. You've had a growing number of jobs. At the bottom, you see what we call stable jobs. Again, this is people in wage employment. It could be seasonal wage employment, but wage employment, or they're small business owners. Um, and there were 37 million net new jobs created on the continent of that variety, which is quite good. However, you also see that the number of vulnerable jobs or people doing something in the informal sector, self-employment, or in subsistence agriculture to earn a living increased by even more, by 52 million. So um, of the population growth, the majority went into these informal types of employment, although it's good that wage employment did grow. Now over the next decade, when you go back to that 122 million um, people that are going to enter the labor force, you see that you're going to need a lot more jobs of all varieties to put those people to work. Now, when we talk about Africa, of course, you all know that it's a very diverse continent, 53 countries. We actually include North Africa when we use the term Africa, so it's the continent as a whole. But we've developed a way of looking at um, Africa that gives a, a different segmentation than you might use here at, at the World Bank. Um, we plot on this chart countries according to, on the vertical axis, how much they export, simply because if you export more, you can import capital goods that are necessary for growth. 
And on the horizontal axis, we show what we call economic diversification. So it's a share of GDP coming from services and manufacturing rather than commodities, natural resources, and agriculture. So at the upper right, you see the diversified economies. These are Africa's most developed countries, some of them even you know, approaching middle income. You have South Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, Morocco, up in that cluster. So they've got well-developed manufacturing and services, uh, and they are exporting a reasonable amount. Um, sort of southwest of the diversified group is what we call the transition economies. And this is a collection of countries geographically from both West Africa and East Africa that have somewhat lower levels of per capita income, interestingly, much faster GDP growth rates. Um, and this would include countries from Ghana and Senegal over to Kenya and Tanzania. To the southwest of that are countries, some of which are sort of post-conflict, where they're still at relatively low levels of private sector development. So the majority of their GDP continues to come from agriculture and natural resources, <clears throat> uh, but, but they aren't terribly successful at exporting yet either. When you look over time, you see countries actually move upwards and to the right. And then the one exception to that rule, of course, is the oil exporting economies, where they're in a very different situation and that they've got high GDP per capita, lots of exports, uh, but by and large, their economies are not very diversified. They're depending on the country, fairly dependent on natural resource exports and oil exports. Um, Nigeria is a little bit different, but certainly Libya, um, Algeria, Equatorial Guinea are very heavily resource dependent. So interestingly, when we use the same segmentation to look at labor markets, we see that there are some commonalities across different levels of economic development. So the first point to note is that in the most diversified economies, such as Tunisia and South Africa, you do have the highest level of wage employment today. And in these countries, actually, you also have very high open rates of unemployment. So people actually, because there are some social benefits, have high rates of unemployment. And interestingly, the what we call vulnerable employment or informal employment is actually quite low. And as you move down the, the level of income per capita and development, you see that in the transition economies, you get maybe a third of the labor force or less, 20 to 30 percent is in these stable forms of employment. The vast majority of people are in vulnerable employment. Unemployment rates are relatively low because people have got to do something. And then down in the pre-transition economies, uh, that trend is even further magnified. So where's Africa going? Well, as I mentioned in the opening remarks, at the rate of stable job creation, so 37 million over the last decade, it's going to take until 2066 before Africa has half of its workforce in stable employment rather than unemployment or vulnerable employment. That's clearly not satisfactory from a human perspective, from a social perspective, and even from an economic perspective. It's a huge waste of potential. So could that be accelerated? Well, we got data from the ILO uh, from Brazil, South Korea, and Thailand that have, they have time series that go back into the 1950s and 60s. So we can look at where were those economies when they were at similar levels of GDP per capita as African countries today? And what was their experience in creating stable jobs? So Brazil, you find out, actually over the 1970s and 80s had this huge burst of stable job creation. And it was moving the share of the workforce into stable jobs at 0.6% per year, which is about 50% faster than what Africa has done. So if African nations could achieve that, you'd get to this um, share of half the people in stable employment by 2046. If you look over at East Asia, you can look at Thailand and South Korea. They achieved even faster rates of growth, two to three times the rate that Africa has achieved. And that actually gets you to half the share within the next you know, 20 years, uh, which is much better. When we laid out our you know, aspirational plan sector by sector of Africa achieving 72 million net new jobs over the next decade, you find that it would reach this goal by 2030. So the point here is not really the exact years, but the point is that at current trends, we're going to have a lot of people in vulnerable employment for a very long time, but by some targeted policies, there's a tremendous opportunity to shorten that by literally decades. So how could you get there? Well, the first point uh, to realize is that, of course, different sectors create 
jobs at different rates. This may not be surprising, but the chart, this chart just shows you Africa as a whole, where do these wage paying jobs come from? And a few things jump out. First is you'll see government and social services are a big employer. And this is, I'll show you shortly, very true in the poorest countries where essentially the public sector is the only game in town in terms of wage employment. And by social services, we're including education and health care, so it's doctors and teachers as well. Um, then you see, surprisingly, agriculture creates a lot of wage paying jobs. So this is the move from subsistence farming into more commercial types of farming and higher value added goods in horticulture. Um, retail and hospitality are two very labor intensive sectors that create a lot of jobs. Um, African manufacturing, I'll talk about a bit. It's been maybe a bit disappointing and not as much job growth there as you would have liked to see, but it still has contributed pretty significantly to the number of stable jobs that have been added on the continent. Interestingly, resources, which are a tremendous contributor to GDP and exports and foreign exchange earnings, uh, actually saw jobs shrink over the last decade. And that's simply because these are very capital intensive industries. And frankly, given some of the labor unrest you see now, what you hear from the owners of, of the mining companies is that they would like to become more labor intensive going forward. So this is, while perhaps important sectors uh, for governments for a lot of reasons, it's not where you're gonna find jobs. So growth that's coming purely from resource sectors are not gonna put people to work. Now, of course, where jobs come from varies by the level of economic development of the country. So on the far left of this chart, you see the pre-transition economies. And there, government and social services is fully half of all stable jobs that are created. After that, wage agriculture is important. And then you get a smattering of private sector, uh, parts of the private sector that are creating jobs. When you move up to the transition economies and then diversified, uh, the private sector becomes the dominant engine of job growth. By the time you get over to the diversified economies, you see that manufacturing, you've got transportation and communication, financial services, retail, and all of these are you know, equally as big or larger than the government and social services in providing jobs. The oil exporters, I wouldn't make too much of. They're a very mixed group of economies. So you have a country like Algeria, um, which is very much like a diversified economy. But then you've got equatorial, um, you know, Guinea, which is maybe more like a pre-transition economy in that oil is really the only game in town. So this average across them, I wouldn't make a lot of. But the general pattern is clear that if you're going to be, think about where will jobs come from, first you have to figure out where are you on the development curve and income curve. And that'll give you some indication of what sectors would you expect to see a lot of growth and job growth in particular. So when we look across sectors, we then went, I mean, McKinsey is a consulting firm. We work with private sector companies. We focused on what's happening in agriculture, manufacturing, retail, and uh, in depth. And we focused on them because, A, we do a lot of work in those sectors, so we feel like we bring some knowledge to bear from the business community. Um, and we looked at an upside case of beyond current trends, how much more job creation could you expect? Um, and the figure, when you add it all up, is 72 million. So what does that entail? Well, in a nutshell, in agriculture, this is assuming that there will be some um, shift in taking uncultivated land into commercial cultivation, and you're seeing that in several different economies in southern Africa. Um, it's a shift to more labor-intensive horticulture crops, so that would be fruits and vegetables, nuts, um, and oil, as well as biofuels. Um, and all of this has the opportunity, because, Af because agriculture is where so many Africans work today, is actually really moves the needle on the number of jobs. Um, manufacturing has another opportunity, 14.8 million new jobs. And this would be by focusing on light manufacturing, which is very labor intensive, as well as more agro-processing of some of the agricultural production on the continent. And in the more diversified economies, they're already priced out of the market for sort of labor intensive, lower cost manufacturing. So there it would need to be more higher tech automotive, um, high tech goods machinery. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about some successes there. And then finally, there's retail and hospitality. And here the key is not so much growth of the sector, but shifting from the informal, 
formats into modern store formats. And modern retail stores are large employers um, in virtually all economies, surprisingly large. And then you've got the ripple effects through the wholesale market, transportation and logistics and so on. Um, so the shift uh, to enable more modern format stores of scale uh, brings with it a lot of jobs and higher wages. Um, and then there's also an opportunity in tourism. And many of you have probably read um, the excellent report put out by the World Bank on opportunities in tourism. So let's take these one at a time. In agriculture, uh, this chart is actually from someone here, uh, and it shows full-time employees per thousands of hectares. And what you see basically is that growing grains is not terribly labor intensive per hectare, and as you move into the horticultural goods, you get many more jobs created. Now, clearly you don't grow a 1,000 hectares of tomatoes, so there's a scale issue. But nonetheless, it is an important source of wage employment, and you've seen you know, countries, for instance, Morocco has a plan to move 20% of its grain production into horticulture for export to Europe. And with that would come many wage jobs. When you look at agro-processing and manufacturing, you see that the majority of manufacturing done in Africa today is either food, beverages, and tobacco, which have to be locally produced, or it's some basic agro-processing. Um, there's very little other manufacturing besides in the diversified economies. However, despite the fact that there's already significant, you know, the, of the manufacturing there is, there's significant agro-processing, we think that there's scope for a lot more processing of goods, be it leather goods, uh, wood, textiles, and apparel making, and this would um, expand the manufacturing base significantly. Um, when we talk about the job strategy, we'll talk about, well, what are the things blocking that progress and what would you need to actually start to capture some of this. It's interesting that when you look around the world, there's a lot of talk in Asia right now about rising wages, and this chart just shows you simple manufacturing labor costs per hour. It's not adjusted for productivity. But the trend is very clear. Wages are rising really very ra rapidly, 16% um, per year in China, fairly rapidly in India, and this makes other countries, including on this chart you see Vietnam and Indonesia, but also Nigeria, and you could put Ethiopia and Mozambique and other African countries that now are quite cost competitive in terms of labor costs. Um, the next step, of course, is getting the infrastructure and business climate in place to enable that to happen. But certainly among global manufacturing countries, companies, there's a uh, realization that already the opportunity in much of, uh, it's certainly in China, but even in large parts of Asia has already been played out. In retail, uh, this chart shows you the, pers the um, for grocery stores, the percent of spending in different countries that goes through informal sort of mom and pop or retail channels or informal markets versus what we call a formal modern format grocery store. And it's quite interesting, it was a done, it was a McKinsey consumer survey that looked at this. Um, and the interesting thing is it, there's huge variation across countries and it's actually completely uncorrelated with level of economic development. So in South Africa, not surprisingly, um, given their income as well as their history, 80% of spending is done through formal stores. But in Egypt, which we put in the same cluster as a diversified economy, only 18% of grocery spending is through a formal retail store. So it's interesting and, and points to really product market and land zoning laws that either enable or stand in the way of development of a modern retail sector. Um, but there's very large opportunities to shift um, from informal to formal and with that would come lots of jobs with wages and opportunities for advancement. In tourism, um, this is actually borrowed from a World Bank report on tourism and the International Tourism Council. When you look at the number of international visitors at some of Africa's top tourist destinations, you see that it stacks up pretty well with some of the other emerging market tourist destinations. So Egypt is you know, already getting many more visitors per year than Indonesia or India, although you know, Thailand and Malaysia are, are huge successes. So it shows both opportunity, but the fact that um, Africa's most visited destinations are, compare pretty favorably to other emerging market tourist destinations. Now, you know, this, this particular report estimates that there could be you know, many, many jobs created on the continent if they were to raise this share, and that would be in the hospitality sector as well as retail, restaurants, and so on.
So what can be done to create jobs? Um, the vac job creation is a vexing issue um, in virtually every country. In the U.S. with the jobless recovery, in Europe where you see countries like Spain with 25 or 50 percent youth unemployment. And the interesting answer is uh, for the labor economists in this room, you know that the issue of how are jobs created was not really one that the economics profession ever really seriously looked at. We assumed that GDP growth would spawn jobs. And labor economists looked at labor market institutions, wage policies, minimum wages, contracting, how do workers find jobs, matching policies, information asymmetries, but not really this fundamental issue of how can we get more jobs if we have high unemployment. And now it's interesting that obviously the World Bank is concerned about it, other international organizations are concerned about it, private companies are thinking about this issue because it is such a fundamental question today. Um, so we've put together our best thinking on what we've seen work, particularly in the African context. The first realization is, well, what does a private sector say? We saw that except for the very poorest countries, jobs come from the private sector. So what do they say is standing in their way? And this shows you the five countries in which we did a business survey at South Africa, Senegal, Nigeria, Egypt, and Kenya. Uh, these were predominantly small and mid-sized companies, a few large companies, but we work mainly with large companies, so we felt like we had a good idea of what they might say. And we had less of a view into the SME market. Um, and you'll see that the answers different, differ across countries to some extent. So in Nigeria, access to financing was the number one mentioned concern, but it was you know, matched by uh, infrastructure, lack of electricity, as well as macroeconomic conditions. In South Africa, there was a lot of concern, just they've had fairly anemic growth, and this was even before the strikes. And so the big concern there was, is there going to be demand, but also accessing to finance. And Egypt, not surprisingly, political stability was on top of mind. This survey was done um, about a year ago. Um, but there is some consistency across the answers as well. So the thing that surprised us, as I said earlier, was the number of businesses who said, look, we want to make sure that governments are really on top of inflation, aggregate demand, and that we continue to see growth, number one. And that was followed then by access to finance and infrastructure. Skills and talent, which is talked about a lot as a constraint in many countries, um, shows up only selectively. So in South Africa, it was an issue about finding the right workers with technical skills. But by and large, there was not a general perception among business that the thing that was standing in their way was poor education of the workforce or inability of finding people to do the job. So with that backdrop, we've created you know, our set of recommendations, which actually completely follow uh, the World Bank development report. So first, focus on target subsectors. Um, our experience, and I think there's growing evidence from the field, is that policies work best when you focus on a particular area, whether it's a geographic area or a subsector in which the country truly has a competitive advantage. Now, this already um, may raise uh, thoughts of industrial policy. Are we calling for industrial policies? Um, we are not calling for industrial policies as commonly understood. Uh, the industrial policies of, you know, protecting infant industries and import tariffs and, and protecting national champions. But we are talking about be pragmatic. If you have a lot of development needs, it's better to target a whole set of policies at a place where the country would have a true competitive advantage or could build one. So it's not building a car industry just because it's prestigious to have a car industry. It's not national champions or it's not building the next semiconductor fab, which many countries have wasted many hundreds of millions and billions of dollars trying to subsidize a semiconductor industry that didn't work. But it is about being realistic about where you could compete or where you could develop a competitive advantage. And then putting in place basically all the things that are needed for that to succeed. So of course there's access to finance. Um, there's also the basic infrastructure, whether it's transportation and logistics or power um, or water and sewage depending on your business. There's the business environment or the um, private sector climate, and this is the microeconomic regulations around moving, making it easier for, for people to start up businesses, to stop businesses, um, and enabling competition in sectors. 
And then finally, there is a piece on worker skills. So depending on the industry, some industries do need very skilled, vocationally trained workers. And of course, if that's a necessity, you've got to make sure you've got the right talent pool. So how does this work out? I'll give you an example, uh, which is Morocco. Um, they have a very successful auto parts industry. Um, they decided over a decade ago that given their proximity to Europe and relatively lower wage rates, they should try to follow the strategy that Mexico did in becoming a platform for automotive production for export to Europe. Um, they started with auto port parts, not full assembly, figuring that's easier and they'd rather move down the value chain. So they've started with automotive supplies and they actually had a government uh, task force that assessed 600 different automotive parts to say where, what should we try to produce? And they looked at similarities across parts and how many vehicles were these parts used in and they ended up selecting 100 that are sort of grouped around 14 specialties and eight different automotive systems. And they went after this opportunity. And the result has actually been very successful. They do export auto parts, um, you know, two billion of them uh, by last count. This sector has created 60,000 jobs. Um, they've got $2 billion in exports. And then the crowning achievement was last uh, December, Renault announced that they were going to build an auto assembly plant for exporting cars to the rest of the world in Morocco. Um, on the left, it shows you some of the specific things that the government provided. First, it was around infrastructure. They had automotive free trade zones and access to a port. Um, they set up, I think it's seven different what they call automotive universities that train everything from automotive design engineers down to technicians who can work on factory lines. So all different skill levels. Um, and then they offered financial incentives to automotive companies. Past MGI research has shown definitively that these are usually a bad value for countries that offer them, yet um, they did, and I didn't want to ignore that and have someone call me on it. So I will admit that they offered tax incentives, although that's not a policy we would necessarily say is beneficial. It often just results in a waste of social value, and you end up giving away some of the value of the jobs that you're creating. And in the unsuccessful cases, like Brazil's automotive industry, they gave away way more value than those jobs ever created. So access to finance, what can you do tactically? Well, there are different options. Um, I'll give you one example um, of just another survey we did on SME financing, actually in around the world. But in sub-Saharan Africa, what you find is that 65 to 80 percent of small businesses that were part of this survey said that they either um, were completely shut out of the market or didn't have enough access to financing. That's a huge opportunity. And when you roll that up, you know, it ends up to be 70 to $90 billion. So clearly we know around the world that small businesses are pretty critical to job growth, particularly the small businesses that expand and grow. And to grow, you typically need external capital. Um, and that would be lending. So filling this gap is critical. Now, how can you do it? Well, there are different ways to try, all of them very tricky. There's incentives for banks to extend loans to a targeted sector. Nigeria's trying that uh, in agricultural lending. There are, um, you know, there have been quotas tried that usually doesn't work very well. India has a quota system where banks have to have 30% of their loan book to, um, there they're defined as rural borrowers. And what this has done is actually just lower lending growth overall because there's also an interest rate cap on those loans and they're heavily uneconomic. So it's actually caused banks to go out and buy government bonds instead of making loans. Um, so that doesn't often work. So you have to be careful about how you make sure you fill this, but there are definite opportunities. Um, foreign investment and foreign capital is another way to fill the gap. Um, this chart shows you the success of tourism in Cape Verde, uh, which was funded very heavily by initial foreign investments in hotels and hospitality and air transport. Um, and you saw foreign direct investment in the country grow, and it's now a major employer in that economy. Infrastructure is the next bit. I did, probably don't have to tell anyone in this room that infrastructure is A, critical to growth and and in Africa, in most parts of Africa, woefully lacking. Um, I'll show you one uh, rather astounding chart about the amount of time it takes to take a container of goods, so off a ship in Dakar, and get it to Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso. This was done by our logistics practice. 
It takes, you know, what you see is up to 18 days. You have to cross 58 checkpoints to get there. Um, overall, the transportation cost adds up to be about over $13,000. Um, if you were to take that same 20-foot container and ship it the same distance within China, you know, it costs more in the realm of $2,500 and you can do it in, you know, less than half the time. So this is just a dramatic example of the need to improve. If you want to have industries, the transportation and logistics piece is absolutely critical. The business environment. Um, the World Bank, of course, has a famous and extremely useful doing business report. I don't probably have to convince you that microeconomic reforms uh, to enable businesses to enter, exit, get credit, resolve court claims, and so on are important to growth. Um, this chart shows you Rwanda's uh, specialty coffee exports, how they went from a system where the government decided what could be grown, how much government controlled buyers of the coffee beans from the farmers um, and then exporting to a system where it was essentially completely liberalized. Farmers choose what to grow. The government sets a minimum price, but other than that, it's completely done through private competitors and coffee exports take off. It's a small example, but it is the power of some, um, I'm not going to call them simple reforms because politically these are often the most difficult ones, uh, but important reforms. And then finally, skills. Um, African education is improving. This chart shows you that as of 2010, about 40% of Africans had secondary or tertiary education degrees. Um, that and that by 2020 on current trends, that's going to go up to about half of the adult population. So that puts them about where you'd see India today, clearly far behind China. The interesting thing is that the share of tertiary education is similar, it's actually higher than China today and similar to India, which has an excellent university system, but it's really the big gap is in the secondary uh, training and, and some of the post-secondary technical skills is where the next big wave of um, focus, you know, we would hope would be. In this business survey we did when asked about this specific issue of skills, um, we heard a variety of responses. Not all of it was about education. There's this common, most common response, good candidates are, are too expensive. And I interpret that to mean there's a supply and demand issue. Beyond that, though, there's some interesting comments, like the people we want to hire don't have enough work experience, or they don't have the soft skills. That's just communication, showing up on time, that sort of work ethic. And that actually goes along with work experience. And then there's a question about technical skills. So if you need an, somebody who can work in a factory with particular technical skills as an employer, it's difficult for you to provide that training. But it all points to significant opportunities for innovations um, in how companies provide training and in maybe private sector participation with local colleges and vocational schools and making sure that there are more, for instance, internships, which would give people the work experience plus some of these soft skills. Um, and we could have a long conversation about some of the new models. Um, and this is true actually not only in Africa, but these are ideas that are you're being talked about in the United States and in Europe. There's a general perception that um, government changing K primary and secondary education is going to take a long time and uh, we can do, we can find solutions much faster, um, you know, setting that aside. So that is um, the summary of what I've got to say and I would love to hear Shanta's um, comments and then take questions from all of you. Uh, before uh, in the drafting of the report. But uh, I, mean, I really do want to say that I welcome this, not just um, for the analysis, but for the, for the optimistic tone. I mean, you know, many of us have been optimistic uh, about Africa over the last you know, five or six years, and it's, it's very refreshing or reassuring when, because we think we come at it with some evidence, and so another group comes at it with, this, with 
evidence as well, uh, reaching the same conclusion. So I think we're onto something here, uh, rather than just uh, pie in the sky. Um, and I think it's, as Asli said, it's a great idea to have this uh, at the time of uh, the launching of the WDR on jobs because this helps us drill down to, to Africa. Um, I'm going to uh, separate my comments into three parts. One is on the diagnosis, which is uh, what uh, the first part of what Susan presented. Then on the on the prescription, if you like, the the strategy, the uh, strategies for job creation. And then I have a suggestion for McKinsey's next report. <laughs> Uh, um, so uh, on the diagnosis, I mean, again, the, the, the numbers, <laughs> imperfect as they are, um, are uh, I have uh, no, no, no problem with. But I would, I would interpret it slightly differently from uh, the way uh, Susan did in terms of that the, the challenge is job creation. Because, you know, if we go back to those numbers and, and the ones that she presented. Under the most optimistic scenario, the share of the labor force that's in vulnerable employment, if you include agriculture and the, the uh, household enterprises, the, the sort of mom and pop shops, under the most optimistic uh, assumptions about growth and about the elasticity of job creation to growth, that share will go from 80% to 78% in 10 years, right? That, that's, that's, the, the, that's, the, that's the good news, <laughs> right? So keep that in mind. So if, and absolutely, we have to do everything possible to increase the creation of what they call stable jobs, or jobs in the formal sector, um, and some of those strategies are there. But even if we do all of that, we'll get that share down to maybe 77%, right? And to, from my point of view, from a poverty reduction point of view, the issue is what do you do about those people in the vulnerable employment uh, regime, in, in agriculture and in household enterprises? Because these people, they have jobs, as Susan mentioned. They're not unemployed. But they have very low paying, low productivity jobs. And that's the, that's the big challenge. And, and we can't hide from it. That's the reality. Um, and indeed, not only us, but our policymakers can't hide from it. I mean, I, my, my biggest challenge is actually when I have discussions with finance ministers. I mean, with, I remember when the Arab Spring hit, you know, there were several sub-Saharan African finance ministers who called me up and said, Shanta, you know, you've been talking about youth employment for a long time. You know, can you, can you write me a two-page note on... Uh, because they were getting worried that this, the storm was going to hit. And I said, look, your problem is not the unemployed university graduates in the capital city. They represent a tiny, tiny fraction of your labor force, and they're the elite, frankly, right? Your problem are those 70% who are working in rural areas at very, very low productivity jobs. Um, and that's, that's not the, that wasn't the Arab Spring uh, uh, phenomenon, that, but that is the sub-Saharan African, low-income sub-Saharan African phenomenon. So I think, you know, while I welcome this analysis, I think we need to shift the political attention to increasing productivity. I want to move the, the political agenda from jobs, from creating jobs in the formal sector, to increasing productivity in the informal sector. Because as, uh, as the WDR says, informal is normal. Uh, now, and, and there's one other slight quibble uh, with uh, the, the McKinsey study, which I would say they, they, they do talk about creating jobs in the agricultural sector. I mean, the, the examples uh, given uh, as well. But there too, let's be very careful because in fact, the the, our job is to get these people in low productivity agriculture to move. And even, and this is one something that, that we're coming up with in, in, in this study on youth employment in Africa that we're doing, and I think my colleague Dion Filmer is somewhere here. <laughs> um, what we find is that even those who move from low productivity agriculture, from smallholder farming, to household enterprises, actually increase their earnings. <laughs> 
Now, from, the, from an outside point of view, this, doesn't, th this is no, no big deal, right? Because you say, well, you go from one job in the informal sector to another job in the informal sector. So what, you know, this is not the, this is not the agenda that we're, we're trying to create. But it, the reality is that there's a slightly higher productivity in the household enterprise, the non-farm household enterprise sector. In fact, that's why they move. And they are moving. Actually, Africa is shedding jobs in the agricultural sector. And that's good. <laughs> that's not a bad thing. Uh, that's, that's how development progresses. Now, having said that, I, I don't want to give the impression that that's the only thing we worry about, because eventually these people will move to the formal sector. That is the process of development that we are trying to, to create. So we do need to focus on the, on the stable jobs, uh, creation of stable jobs as well. But the time frames are daunting, shall we say. Um, and, and in fact, there's a little bit of disagreement even within my team, because I keep saying eventually they will move. And really, if you really think about it, it's the, not the people who are currently in the informal sector who will move, but their children. That, it's a generation that, that you're going to see the big, big shift. But that's fine. So you, if you can increase the productivity of the people in the informal sector, they can afford to send their children. First of all, they can afford to educate their children better and then send them to uh, jobs in the formal sector, and then you get this process uh, playing itself out. So now let me get to the, the, the strategy or the prescriptions, if that's the diagnosis. Um, because, and, and you know, I have no problems with the, with the uh, prescriptions about infrastructure, business climate, uh, and everything else. Uh, but I, I think, and, and Susan mentioned this with the example from, of transport, take, take infrastructure, it's a lot harder than just saying government should focus on the value chain uh, and infrastructure. Because as the, as the transport example illustrates, this is a fundamentally political problem. The reason why transport prices are so high, you know, those transport prices from Dakar to, to Bamako are much higher than the pure vehicle operating costs. Now, the difference between that transport price and the vehicle operating costs is the profit margin accruing to the trucking companies. And those are the order of 100%. Now, well, how do they do that? Well, it turns out there are regulations in the books that prohibit entry into the trucking industry. These regulations were put in, put in place about 50 years ago when they thought trucking was a natural monopoly or some, uh, some nonsense like that. Um, and as a result, though, you've got a very powerful trucking lobby that will resist any attempt at deregulation. And, the, and to tell you that this is not just pie in the sky, the, the one country, Rwanda, did deregulate trucking, and transport prices fell by 75% in real terms. And you know, I, I, I actually go and talk to some of these truckers too, and I was asking them, you know, what's going on here? Because I asked the guy, you know, why don't you just charge a lower price? Because you can get a lot more business. He said, I tried that. They burnt my truck. Right? This is a very powerful cartel. <laughs> the $200,000 truck was just gone. <laughs> All right? So let's, let's not over, uh, and, and, and this is, this, now, one other thing though, uh, the, the McKinsey study seemed to say in their current interviews the skills constraint was not, did not seem to be binding when, you know, for most of them. They came in fourth or fifth on that list. And that's, and that's consistent with, with our findings as well. But I think we need to be careful because going forward it, it may become binding at some point. And so we need to anticipate that as well. But there too, I really think the problem with skills is not that, and, and we should not take uh, too much uh, uh, confidence, have too much confidence in the fact that the share of Africans in, with, prior, with secondary and tertiary education is rising. Because when you start looking at the quality, even of the primary education, it becomes very, very depressing. So the, the guys who go to primary school, you know, just to give you one factoid of, of the students in seventh grade in Tanzania, something like 20% of them couldn't read a sentence in Kiswahili, uh, and 30% of them couldn't do a two-digit multiplication problem, and 50% of them couldn't read English. And this is, and English is the medium of instruction in, um, in uh, secondary school. And th th this, is, this is a crisis. 
Um, and we, we need to start working on that rather than building more universities <laughs> at, the, at this point uh, uh, in order to get there. Okay, and then just one last point about uh, access to finance, which is absolutely uh, correct. But there's an interesting twist there about access to finance in the informal sector. Because that comes up even in the surveys of inf in the informal sector. How do, you, how do you make your little mom and pop shop a little bit bigger? You know, how do you, you know, they say well, they're making uh, clothing and how do you buy a, a, a better sewing machine? Well, you need to have credit, right? But the answer is not simply to create finance. It turns out that one of the most powerful tools, and this is again echoed in the WDR, is management training. You give these micro enterprises very simple training like in bookkeeping. And what that does is it enables them to document their assets. And they can use that as collateral to get credit. So again, going at it from the demand side uh, rather than the supply side uh, can, be, can be valuable. Um, then one, yeah, and then a final comment, I can't resist the comment about industrial policy because this is a subject <laughs> that we've been discussing, Asla and I have been discussing for five years now. Um, no, but I, I think there is a, and this is a nice, uh, this, this study is a nice illustration of that. You can take the broad uh, categories of sectors, roughly competitive, um, and then you look at what you're proposing to do in those sectors, those aren't really targeted. I mean, if you're tr trying to improve infrastructure, some of it really cuts across sectors. Uh, trying to improve the business climate it cuts, across, uh, cuts across sectors. Uh, so I view this, this focus on sectors not necessarily as a, a purely economic issue that it, you know, if we don't focus on these sectors, we won't get these, uh, get these benefits. But it's a political issue, again. This is a way to sell reforms to some of our recalcitrant governments. Uh, because, you know, I mean, let's be honest, I, I go in and I tell these governments, well, you gotta, you gotta deregulate trucking monopolies and things like that, and they, they say all sorts of nasty things to me, right? Like, this is the Washington consensus all over again, what, you know, all of this stuff. But now, what we can do, and this is what we do with the, um, with the, the Ethiopia light manufacturing study as well, is to say, Look, if you do these things, the same things, you know, the infrastructure, the business climate, access to finance, and, and things like that, you can go, at the, as the Ethiopia light manufacturing study shows, you can go from 9,000 jobs in the garment sector to a million jobs. That suddenly makes the policy make, gives the policymakers something, <laughs> a hook to, 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 uh, to hold on to. And that might be, be give us the change. Okay, finally, my suggestion for your next report. Uh, actually, this is a report that I'd like to write, but I don't, I don't think I can politically. So that's why. I... No, because, and, and it's got to do with jobs. I mean, if you accept this idea that what we want to do is to increase productivity, and you take that chart that she showed about how Africa, uh, the popula African working age population is going to be the largest in the world. Well, the other side of that is that the working age population in developed countries is going to be some of the smallest in the world. Well, what does that tell you? That the returns to low-skilled migration are huge for both sides, both the sending country and the receiving country. You know, and my, my friend Lance Pritchett does these calculations that shows that you know you can increase productivity fivefold. You know, all of the stuff that we're talking about, <laughs> none of that's going to increase these people's productivity by five five hundred percent. But just this one thing can increase productivity fivefold. It's, I, I'm not talking about brain drain or anything. This is low-skilled uh, migration. These are the people who are going to be the street sweepers and the, uh, the hospital orderlies uh, in developed countries. And the point of the question is, there's nobody else who's going to do that in those developed countries. So to me, the big ticket item, this is as big as, foreign, as, as multilateral trade. The big ticket item could be allowing low-skilled migration going from poor African, low-income African countries to high-income European countries. Now, you can see why I can't write that report, but I encourage you, and we will give you lots of analysis to back it up if you guys could write it. Thank you. Okay.
Santa, wonderful. Thank you for a very good comment. And we'll give you a chance to respond, Susan. But I also want to open it up to uh, comments and questions from the floor before we lose our audience. It's, people are getting hungry, I guess. <laughs> And I also have a question for you. I mean, I uh, really appreciate the enthusiasm and the optimism of the report, but I want to ask you, what are some of the risks that you see that might stop Africa from achieving these uh, goals? Mm. Well, there are a lot of risks. Um, I mean, of all the risks that Shanta just told you about, the political incumbents, that are blocking change, uh, which is why I said that the microeconomic reforms are important but not easy. <laughs> I mean, it is, you know, the fact is there are folks who benefit from the status quo, and in fact, you're growing very wealthy off from the status quo, and so clearly it's difficult. Um, so I think there are many things. I'd like to say that um, I appreciated Shanta's comments very much, um, and I think we, we have more or less the same perspective. One response I could give is, well, we focus on the stable job creation because that's what we do as a company. And what do we know about moving people from the farm into household enterprises? So we'll leave it to our colleagues at the World Bank to do that. But I would actually push back a little bit more because of this analysis that shows, look, you can shorten the time um, in which you have the majority of your population in the vulnerable jobs by decades, by 30 three years by one back of the envelope calculation, which is huge. Um, so let's, I would think we would agree there's no trade-off. You need to focus on both sides of the pie, but don't discount the fact that, that you know, replicating, okay, let's not use South Korea. Maybe they're exceptional and maybe nobody else can do that. But Thailand or Brazil, I mean, these are not, it's not unachievable. And if you could replicate their, um, episodes of rapid labor-intensive job growth, you can shorten by decades uh, the amount of time you've got to focus on that uh, vulnerable population. Now, as for your next study um, idea, uh, it's, it's intriguing. It's one we've actually talked about. Uh, believe it or not, we actually feel some of the same political <laughs> pressures about <laughs> recommending <laughs> low-skill immigration, uh, but we can, we can take that offline. Okay, so questions here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Susan, very impressive performance and good to see you after 15 years. <laughs> a, a thought experiment. Suppose we were to look at Africa, change the lens, remove the McKinsey lens, maybe even remove the World Bank lens for the time being, and look at it from the lens of China, India, and even USA, and say, what can Africa learn? A couple of big questions stand out. First, you left out the modern services as a driver. You know, if we look at India, you know, the exports of modern services have taken mm -hmm. off, and if we look at data, we see that jobs in the manufacturing sector are shrinking, even in Africa. It's the services that are growing. We don't even have, have to worry about what Lan Prichard and Shanta have to say about people migrating. You can send your services through the internet, and that will continue to explode. Perhaps that may be a very important thing to look at, you know. Let me flip to another thought experiment. We invest a lot in infrastructure and transport, but we have an agenda on urbanization. You know, when we look at China, we see that most of the new jobs are being created in intermediate-sized cities, not big cities. Manufacturing is shifting out from expensive land areas to if we have a better understanding of that in Africa, we can probably tie up job, transport, urbanization together. The third thing is, as Shanta pointed out, the informal jobs, particularly in non-agricultural sector, account for more than 50% of the jobs. But when we examine the fiscal policy, informal jobs are not integrated into the fiscal policy. It's not integrated in any institutions. But informal jobs are not bad. I mean, the biggest gains we can make is if we can integrate the informal sector in the work we do, from public expenditure review to fiscal policy to everything. And finally, from the US perspective, a lesson from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a resource-intensive area. It came up with a huge steel plant. 
but no other enterprises sprung up. You talked about small, large, young, old, but Africa is very resource intensive. It's very likely that large enterprises with resource intensive, other enterprises are not, will not grow and we know that without young, many more firms, jobs are not going to grow. So maybe for the next report, change the lens from McKinsey and put on some other lenses to see what lessons we can learn. Let's take a couple more comments. Frank. Susan, thank you very much. Great analysis, uh, really fun to watch. Uh, love the analysis, love the prescription, and that included your High Wire Act balance beam dance around industrial policy because we feel exactly the same arguments and discussions in FPD. Um, I think Shanta is absolutely right. The, this, if we can put a business case around the opportunities as our entry argument for policymakers, we have an entirely different discussion, and I think that's something we should aim for. But what I'm curious about is I want to make sure I understood you correct, um, um, to make, uh, because it didn't necessarily come out clearly. When you're saying, so you look at individual industries, however broad or narrowly you want to define them, um, and you then look at the, uh, the sub-areas, the access to finance, the policy, the skills, the physical infrastructure, you do suggest that in each one of these areas there should be an industry lens and an industry focus to it, surely not at the exclusion of others, but a targeted effort to support the competitiveness of these individual industries. Or do we want to go broad, because we're good at that at the World Bank. We, we are already access to finance uh, or infrastructure plans or education programs and, and vocational training programs at national levels. Do I get the difference right in what you're suggesting? Okay, and I want to follow up on that question because this is uh, something that bothers me as well. Do you agree with Shanta's characterization of what you said? In a way, what I heard him say is that it's almost like focusing on the general things, the business environment, regulations that constrain, but focus it on an area per se. It's not really picking, but then what Frank is suggesting is that you need to pick the, uh, you know, the industries where you think that the country is going to have the competitive advantage. Now that's a question generally we have difficulty with because we don't know that countries could properly pick those industries. So I want to push you a little bit on Okay, maybe we turn to you now. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, no, what, what I'm saying is what Frank is saying. I mean, what we're saying is if you're going to say uh, the light manufacturing report um, on Ethiopia and Mozambique was fantastic, so congratulations to anyone in the room that was working on that. Take that example. If you say Ethiopia can go after apparel manufacturing, what we're saying is it's great if you have a national infrastructure program, but make sure that you get that connection to the port. Um, and if you don't have money for all of it, don't go building roads for agriculture if what you want to focus on is getting light manufacturing going. And the same would be for business environment. If you have scope to do lots of business environment reforms, great. But if you're going to pick one political battle for the year, uh, make sure it's around whatever you'd need to get, for instance, a competitive manufacturing sector. Um, and if the transport and logistics aren't important, then save that for another day. So I guess what we're saying is don't have uh, access to finance policy that's targeting farmers and infrastructure that's building airports and where you want to see jobs is in retail. <laughs> so completely unrelated. And it's more an issue of sequencing. It's not to say it's not all important someday, but if you bring together the different elements so that you have everything in place, in your target subsector. And so this is where it does start to sound like mm -hmm. the terrible I word of industrial policy. How do you distinguish the two? Well, uh, so industrial policy is one of those terms that's maybe a lightning rod. Uh, when I say industrial policy, I think about um, import tariffs to keep out competition. This is, or, or possibly subsidizing particular companies. So I think about uh, industrial policy the wrong way is actually highly anti-competitive. Um, whereas I think what we're saying is nothing about, if anything, it's just the opposite. Create competition. 
uh, don't necessarily pick the firms. Now, it's been brought up, probably it was by you, Shanta, in one of our conversations. Well, what if you decide that the target subsector happens to be your brother-in-law's, you know, business? Uh, to which I probably said, you know, look, that's always a risk. We can't, I mean, on some level, governments are going to have to do the right thing, right? Like, we can't, sitting in Washington, to design policies that are foolproof uh, completely, and hopefully that wouldn't happen. But at least starting with a conversation of what realistically makes sense, and don't go after the next Silicon Valley cluster or the automotive industry just to have a national sense of pride. Okay, we have some questions from online, one from Malawi. How will growth of wage jobs address underemployment and benefit those in the informal sector rather than just expanding opportunities for those already in the formal sector? And another interesting one from Ghana. Many jobs in teaching and nursing rely on publicly funded education, but there is little return with brain drain and our teachers and nurses are leaving for higher wages. How do you change this costly dynamic? Those are great questions. Um, I think that the first question uh, from Malawi about how is this going to benefit the majority of the workforce which remains in the vulnerable sector? Um, and I would have two answers. One is I think that I believe in this generational dynamic, that over time the process of development is moving off the farm and from self-employment for most people into wage-paying formal sector jobs. And when you think about working adults now in, say, subsistence agriculture, the chances that they personally are going to migrate into a formal sector job are probably not terribly high for most of them. But the issue is creating the opportunities then for the next generation. So one answer is generational. Um, and the second answer is uh, just from that grocery chart that you saw, creating jobs in the formal sector creates higher productivity and higher wages. This leads to more spending, not only in the formal sector, but in the informal sector. So in Egypt, it appears that you know, the formal sector employees are doing still the vast majority of their grocery shopping at the informal stores. So there are some spillover effects. I think the key, the key point, and one of the reasons we focused on the f formal sector, is that that's where you get productivity, growth, and economies of scale. Um, I think it's intriguing and really interesting to look at the research that Shanta was mentioning about how when you move from subsistence agriculture to even a household enterprise, even though it's low productivity, it's still higher than agriculture. And there's maybe a good challenge about how could you dramatically help those small household enterprises, I think, group together or grow in scale. Um, but Certainly we know that in the formal sector you get economies of scale, you get management technologies, you get technological change, all of this leads to more productivity and rising incomes, and then that spending benefits everyone in the economy. Um, from Ghana, a great question about the teaching and nursing jobs. Those are important sources of employment. Not only, well, those are important sectors, first for employment, second to raise the educational quality and levels you see in Africa and the health outcomes. Um, and it's a good question about this brain drain. Uh, so already you see it, Shanta, unfortunately it's not the low skill labor, but you see in any U.S. hospital, you go and where are the nurses from? Well, they're from all over the world, virtually. <laughs> um, and for governments, I think that this pool of expatriate labor is interesting to try to tap. Um, you, what you've seen in India is some reverse brain drain. Uh, you see it actually even within my company um, with with Indian nationals, people returning uh, because the economy is booming and they have huge opportunities. Um, and so maybe one of the challenges for governments like Ghana will be to what, how can you create the programs and incentives to try to get some of those people back. Ghana is an interesting case because of their new oil fines. I mean, if they can have growth take off, I think that. There's good evidence in both China and India that if you can get some economic dynamism, there is um, a good segment of expatriate labor that will come home and start to invest in, in the local economy beyond just sending remittances. So let's have another the round of questions back there. Uh, my name is Paul Wade. Uh, uh, maybe use one of those microphones. Mic, yeah. um, yeah, I, I might be just kind of reading between the lines. I might be not uh, knowing 
all the reports since I haven't read it, but it seemed to me like one approach in the report was to look at what was the experience of East Asian countries, how did they grow fast, and so on, and try to see what kind of gap is there with African countries, and then try to close that gap by the right uh, steps. Uh, however, if you look at the situation for, for Africa as a continent with close to 50 countries, and I would guess probably 45% of them, 40, 45, maybe 50 of them are landlocked with tremendously high transport costs to get to the coast to then have fairly cheap access to global markets. I think that's quite different from the starting point for East Asian countries. Out of those countries, I think only Laos is landlocked. So basically, I think we have a, a, a two very different groups in Africa. Of course, you have the kind of quatronomy that you set up, but at least the dichotomy of you have all those landlocked countries, which are really hinterland, and then you have the ones at the, at the edges uh, with the coast. And for the landlocked ones, I cannot imagine that they will ever have a competitive advantage on transporting heavy goods and manufacturing to the coast and out. Because even if they are, they're, you know, compared to Asia and Latin America now, the wages are competitive, they will not be competitive to the coastal countries in Africa itself. So what I'm wondering if you and McKinsey looked at, is there a different approach than I, I mean, I'm kind of extrapolating that you looked at export-led growth to world markets. Did you look at either export-led growth to internal markets? So it's more like growing with your neighbor internally in, in the continent. And did you look at the potential for rather going for, for services, uh, including the potential from internet and so on, uh, assuming that you get good uh, fiber optic infrastructure within Africa, then there shouldn't be that much cost difference between a call center in India, Pakistan, or somewhere on the African continent. <coughs> so <coughs> have you looked at those opportunities? So it's more about looking at what kind of markets would be the demand drivers, and then not only export-led growth to, to world markets, and then whether it's more on, on the information-based services. Thanks. OK, let me take the final questions before I turn back. Yes. Red. <laughs> uh, Richard America from Georgetown University. Good to see you, Susan. Uh, you mentioned management education or management training as, as a key uh, to improving uh, the performance of small enterprise, but that, that's throughout the economy. Weak management, uh, I've concluded, and others uh, concur, is a major constraint, maybe the big constraint. And if you improve the quality of management, many other benefits will flow in every sector, agribusiness, manufacturing, transport, healthcare, across the board. I've been talking with my uh, friends from Liberia who are here and hoping that the University of Liberia and other universities will focus on business schools. If you create a strong business school, it will have tremendous benefits for the entire economy very quickly. And uh, uh, I hope the World Bank will uh, give at least that sector of higher education uh, due attention and resources. Any final comments before I turn to Shanta and Susan? No? OK. Floor is back to you. Should I, should I, I was just going to answer Paul's question about landlocked countries, because even though I work with him. Uh, I have to say, Paul, I have a very different view of landlocked countries, the constraints facing landlocked countries. And there's quite a bit of evidence, uh, including that transport uh, chart that uh, Susan showed, that the problem is not that they're landlocked. There's a whole series of policies and regulations that lower the, that, that increase the, the costs of transport that have almost nothing to do with their landlocked. I mean, for instance, these tr high transport costs that that landlocked countries have, it turns out that over half of those costs are borne at the port. So the port of Dar es Salaam actually is, is a source of the high costs of, of uh, uh, transport in Rwanda. And the, and the goods stay seven, eight days in the port before they ever, ever get, uh, get shipped. So the fact that you're in Tanzania doesn't make you any better. The other is that you, you think about air, uh, uh, you know, the one thing that landlocked countries might be able to do is to have um, uh, air transport. But it turns out there's this nice study by Aditya Muttu that shows that 
air transport uh, constraints or regulations are much more severe in landlocked countries than in coastal countries. So the one thing that they can do to improve their competitiveness is the one thing they don't do. In fact, the title of the paper is Landlocked or Policy Locked. Uh, so I, I really think this is a very different problem from just being the fit geographic uh, uh, landlockedness. Okay, I would, I would only add to that. Not only, um, you know, you have examples in Africa. You have mango exports from Mali. Now I realize Mali has fallen on hard times, shall we say. But they were successful when they put in, in place the right infrastructure uh, to get mangoes out with refrigerated transportation and to the ports and to Europe. And they increased exports maybe tenfold, despite being landlocked. And when you look at where investment is in China, it's no longer on the coast, and it hasn't been for about f at least the last five years. Any investment that's going into China in terms of the export industries is all in the interior provinces, because the coastal wages are, are just way too high. Um, so on, so on some level, that's the same as African landlocked countries. So I think I, we would agree that being landlocked isn't necessarily a constraint, uh, even for the export market. Now that said, I want to be clear, w the methodology that we used here, we did look at what was the experience of some of these other countries, Brazil, Thailand, South Korea. We didn't then say, how can Africa get there? We said, well, that's interesting. That's a lot better. I mean, we were just curious to say, well, is this just a slow process and you just have to wait over time? for the population to shift into stable employment. And we said, well, no, actually, with some targeted policies, these countries actually raised wage employment very much more rapidly than what you're seeing in Africa. Then we went and looked sector by sector, forgetting those numbers, just saying, OK, what would be an aspirational but reasonable case for African manufacturing? And we went through and said, well, what types of manufacturing could you see? How much growth would be, you know, somewhat aspirational but achievable, and that's how we came up with our bottom-up estimate. Um, that said, I think you did raise some interesting points that were raised earlier about what about the internet, what about service exports, you could have call centers anywhere, you can have IT back office shops, you can have payroll processing, um, and that is an opportunity. India's experience, I think, is interesting. On one hand, when you look at India as a whole, it's such a huge country that the IT BPO sector employs about 1% of the workforce. <laughs> uh, still, that translates into, I think it's a million and a half, you know, really well-paid jobs. So is that a big opportunity or not? Um, it doesn't solve Shanta's problem with two-thirds of the population of vulnerable employment, but it is a potentially good source of, you know, a million highly paid jobs for predominantly young people with good language skills and computer skills is something that certainly would be an opportunity. And some of the new work we're doing is um, saying that the whole range of categories of tasks that can be done through the internet is actually expanding quite dramatically. Um, it's not just the traditional IT support and call center work, but now you're starting to see these platforms in advanced economies where they take jobs and bid it out. So say translating a paper. There's online services where you go and they bid it out to people, translators around the world. It could be anyone, someone sitting in their home, it could be someone sitting in, in Mali, um, it could be anyone. Uh, and, and there's some interesting questions and I don't know the answer about how big of an opportunity could that be to create jobs, particularly for young people who have the internet tech skills in Africa. Business education and management talent, uh, we've had this conversation. I mean, when you talk to larger and medium-sized businesses in Africa, there is a common discussion about how do you get management talent. Um, not the very top management talent, but how do you get the mid-level tier cohort of managers? And it's a big missing gap, and I was fascinated to hear about how even giving micro-entrepreneurs entrepreneurs some very basic um, management skills would enable them then to, for instance, keep record books that allow them to get a loan. Um, so I couldn't agree with you more uh, about the need to continue to build that out, but I know you're working with universities on the continent to get that done. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Please join me in thanking both Susan and Shanta for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.